Welcome to Political Perspectives from the Washington Examiner. I'm Jim Antle, and I'm joined today by Editor-in-Chief Hugo Gurdon. Hugo, the Democratic ticket is now complete. We know who all of our principals are going to be on both sides of the aisle. What was your reaction to Kamala Harris's pick? Well, the, my first reaction, Jim, was one of, of, of su- slight surprise, because what she did was very much what uh, Donald Trump did with his ticket, and that is to appoint someone who doubled down on the qualities that he was bringing himself to the ticket, so that when Donald Trump appointed or chose J.D. Vance, it was saying, I'm doubling down on Trumpism, on my appeal to blue-collar workers, etc. What Kamala Harris has done, uh, defying expectations that she would try and balance the ticket, for example, with Governor Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania, was to double down on her left-wingery. She chose one of the most left-wing governors in the country, the, uh, Tim Walz of, uh, of uh, Minnesota, uh, who has a, a very left-wing uh, reputation, uh, w- well-deserved reputation. And it seems to suggest to me that uh, either she was under considerable pressure from the left wing of her party to go with uh, the darling of the left, uh, or else she is not so much under pressure herself from that wing, but she's very much part of that wing. And actually, that's what I wanted to ask you, Jim, is how do you interpret the fact that she chose to go with the doubling down? Is this caving to the left? Is this signaling that she is left? How do you see it? Well, I think there are a couple of different ways that you can look at it. I think the two main things are Israel and ambition, I think, undid Shapiro. I think definitely she was caving to the left. I think she was fearful of putting Michigan in danger at the price of trying to lock down Pennsylvania. But I also thought that there was a sense in which that Josh Shapiro seemed to have presidential ambitions of his own, maybe was a little bit ambivalent. Uh, about leaving the Pennsylvania governorship without completing even his first term, uh, and maybe didn't want to hitch his wagon to Harris in this tough presidential race. So I think the fact that he wasn't left enough and they're really worried about this progressive backlash over Gaza and the fact that they weren't sure that Shapiro didn't have uh, maybe his own agenda in terms of his nas- national aspirations. I think both of those factors made them view walls as a safer pick. Yeah, it, it, let's have a look now at the phone call that Kamala Harris made to Tim Waltz. Uh, obviously, it was a scripted phone call. Uh, it was scripted not only in what they said, but also in the way that they looked. Let's have a look at that because I'd like to get your comments on that. Hi, this is Tim. It's Kamala Harris. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Madam Vice President. Listen, I want you to do this with me. Let's let's do this together. Would you be my running mate and let's get this thing on the road? I would be honored, Madam Vice President. Uh, The joy that you're bringing back to the country, the enthusiasm that's out there, uh, it would be a privilege to take this with you across the country. Jim, what what struck me looking at this is that it was really the way that Tim Waltz looked. He was sitting there, he was wearing a t-shirt, he was wearing a hunting cap, he was looking very casual. And this was an attempt, was it not, to try and make him look like a Trump voter, to look like, uh, he, to, to be somebody who was just an ordinary guy, a blue collar guy who would appeal to Trump voters. To, to some extent, this was a way of trying to neutralize that appeal of Trump. Is that how you saw it as well? My view is that Tim Walls is sort of radical politics wrapped in a fun Midwestern dad persona. So he's they're trying to sort of both appeal to the left, but also sort of neutralize maybe the off putting aspects of this uh, to other voters, to swing voters, uh, particularly in the Midwest, by making him seem sort of authentic and, and folksy and and all of the things that Harris is is really not. Right. So, but if you peel away that out of veneer on Tim Walsh, what you find is a governor who presided over a state which was more racked probably than any other by the riots uh, in uh, um, after the death of uh, George Floyd. Uh, he's a governor who is very much, it seems, for open borders. Uh, right. He wants to find a path to citizenship for 80 or 90,000 illegal immigrants in his state. He wants to give them health care. He wants to give them education. Uh, He's really a radical, isn't he? 
he's definitely a radical. And there's, you know, just the question of can you uh, wrap him in this veneer and have it be effective? It, it, Harris herself has always faced authenticity questions, whether she's uh, a little bit fake, whether she adapts her persona uh, to different audiences she's trying to appeal to. Uh, so there's a little bit of a danger with that with walls or whether even sort of imagery is enough to overcome that record. I suspect rather than appealing to working class voters, he's kind of going to be the democratic leaning uh, suburban voters idea of a guy who might appeal to blue collar voters. And so I think as much as anything else, they're hoping that Walls will turn out some of the suburban voters in these uh, in these swing states. And it may give us a little bit of sense of how the Harris team sees the electoral map. Right. So, so that, that's that's interesting, Jim. But how let's talk just briefly before we end on how the Harris pick has affected the Trump campaign, because ever since she took over as the pick for the Democrats and uh, Joe Biden was pushed aside, uh, Trump has seemed to be to have lost direction for a week or two. I mean, he's right. continued, for example, to attack Joe Biden, even though, of course, he's gone after Kamala Harris. Uh, that, that you know, that it, there have been people who've suggested that really what he wanted to do was revenge on Biden for having beat him in 2020. But now that Biden, he's, Biden has been defeated, he's sort of not as engaged as he was. Sure. But one of the things that has happened since the Harris made her beat pick is that it does, I think, suggest, or there are hints that it has galvanized the um, the, the campaign of of Trump. It has it has made the Trump campaign. So sort of more clear sighted about what the the ticket that they face is and that it's a very left wing ticket. And they seem to be now kind of getting into gear, uh, trying to frame this as a, a very left wing ticket. In fact, the most left wing ticket there's ever been in this country. And right. it, it also perhaps suggests that, that uh, J.D. Vance has slightly got into gear after a pretty faltering start. Yeah, I think J.D. Vance is really starting to find his footing as a communicator on behalf of the Trump campaign. They're really deploying him to a lot of places. But I, I do think having the Democratic ticket in place has helped them sort of focus what their line of attacks are going to be. So clearly, they're still going to want to tie Harris back to the Biden administration, even though she's running as if she's the incumbent uh, attorney general of California. Uh, but this is now a unique ticket that can be branded as the most left wing in history. And a lot of the attack lines that they could use against Harris really neatly fit into the attack lines that they could use against Walls. And so it, it really, I think, comes into focus with a kind of message that I think Republicans are very comfortable uh, in, a, in a messaging war waging against the Democrats. Yeah, that's just a final uh, area that I just wanted to, to have an exchange on. And that is, it, the do we think do you think that the Harris's pick was a good one or a bad one? What do you score it out of ten? And the reason I ask that is simply, it was perfectly clear that the Trump campaign and Republicans were very worried that she might uh, pick Josh Shapiro, mm -hmm. and who we were just talking about, who is centrist and has seemed sensible on a whole number of issues. Now he was somebody that she was concerned, as you said about you know losing michigan for her because of the uh, you know, because he's quite supportive of israel and he's jewish mm -hmm. but i think that the trump campaign and many republicans are probably breathing a sigh of relief that she didn't pick him and think that they would have had a harder time if if she had yeah i th i think wallace is a 5 at best on a on a 10 point scale uh doesn't uh, come from a state that really seems to be in play as much as it was when it was a Trump versus Biden race, uh, is pretty left wing despite the folksy packaging. Uh, you know, it, it's a pretty big risk to not try to take one of the main battleground states off the board. And there were several options uh, besides Josh Shapiro for potentially doing that. Uh, so, you know, I, I think obviously he presents well, and that's an advantage I think the ticket has over the Biden-led ticket is that they present well in a very favorable media climate. Uh, but substantively, there's a lot, I think, for Republicans to work with there. And it was a pretty big risk on Harris's part. Right. Right. I agree with that. Thank you, Hugo. And thank you all for joining Political Perspectives. I'm Jim Antle from The Washington Examiner.